It's summer 1943, and the Allied forces have moved to secure the Mediterranean from the Axis powers once and for all. This means one thing, neutralizing Italy, a staunch German ally led by the fascist dictator Benito Mussolini, sweeping away the Italian navy, which performed atrociously against Allied forces. Allied soldiers at last began to make landfall on Sicily. From captured airfields, American and British bombers could now reach Rome, and an intense bombing campaign begins against Italy's capital. The intent is not so much to damage Italian industry and its warfighting ability, but rather to capitalize on the low morale of Italian troops and citizens and force them to overthrow Mussolini, thus suing for peace with the Allies. Throughout the war, aside from a few notable exceptions in Africa, Italian forces performed extremely poorly and soon Hitler was sending experienced officers to supervise his allies' military. The Germans saw it as a babysitting assignment, and the Italians were simply sick of war. They'd been lied to, after all. Mussolini had promised to turn the Mediterranean into a giant Italian lake, and now the Allies were on Italian territory. The time was ripe for revolution, and shortly after the beginning of the bombing campaign, the Italian government ousted Mussolini, imprisoning him on a mountaintop ski resort a secure prison for one of the world's most dangerous men. This was a disaster for Hitler, but he had one ace up his sleeve, a single man, Otto Skorzeny, possibly the most dangerous man of World War II. Skorzeny had made a name for himself as a firebrand Nazi and devout fascist, quickly climbing the ranks of the German military. Skorzeny's first ambition had been to become a pilot, and shortly after the invasion of Poland he had volunteered for the Luftwaffe, but was denied for being too tall. At 6 foot 4 inches, Otto was a formidable man indeed, and when his imposing bulk prevented him from becoming a pilot, he joined Adolf Hitler's personal bodyguard regiment instead. As Hitler launched his invasion of the Soviet Union, Skorzeny was back on the front lines, fighting with elite SS units. As the Nazis pushed closer to Moscow, Skorzeny received orders from Hitler himself. He was to capture several key Communist Party buildings and the NKVD headquarters. This would have afforded the German military with huge amounts of valuable intelligence and bid a devastating blow to Soviet fighting morale. But Skorzeny's greatest prize was the sluice gates to the Moscow Canal. Hitler had plans to open the sluice gates wide and let all of Moscow flood, turning the Soviet capital into a lake. Fortunately for the Soviets, the German advance began to falter and then halt. Far too valuable to be lost on the Eastern Front, Otto Skorzeny was ordered back to Germany after being hit in the back of the head by shrapnel. Healing from his injuries, Skorzeny had nothing but time on his hands, time that he used to contemplate his previous orders to capture important communist buildings, the Soviet secret police headquarters, and the Moscow Canal sluice gates. Skorzeny felt that the German military lacked units specialized in such forms of unconventional warfare and began to develop theories on waging unconventional warfare deep behind enemy lines. He studied historical partisan movements and spoke with experienced infantry and paratrooper commanders. In a time before special forces, Otto Skorzeny was developing the first modern plan for a special operations task force. Skorzeny's task force would operate deep behind enemy lines and use subterfuge, espionage, and intelligence rather than brute force to achieve its objectives. By Skorzeny's accounting, a small team of specialized commandos could easily accomplish more than an entire company of infantry could. He was only too right, as British commandos were already training and preparing for deployment behind enemy lines on mainland Europe. The powers that be were slow to listen to Skorzeny, however, at least until British commandos began raiding behind enemy lines in Europe to devastating success. To even his staunchest critics, Skorzeny was quickly proved right. A small team of elite soldiers could in fact accomplish far more than entire companies of infantry could. Skorzeny's name was quickly put forward to command Nazi Germany's first true special operations training schools, and soon he was made commander of the Waffen Sonderverband ZBV Freidenthal Special Forces Unit. Germany may not have been short on syllables, but they were short on allies, and one of Skorzeny's unit's first missions was to parachute behind enemy lines in Iran and contact local tribes. It was hoped that tribal members in Iran could be incited to attack Allied supply lines to the Soviet Union, which despite its massive manpower was almost completely reliant on American supplies for its war effort. Luckily for the Soviets, the effort was deemed unsuccessful when most of the tribes contacted refused to take part in raids. Skorzeny's next efforts, however, would be much 
much more fruitful for Nazi Germany. After Mussolini's ousting from power by the Italian Grand Council of Fascism, Hitler knew that the Italian king would declare an armistice with the Allies. This would be a major setback for the German war effort as Italy had forced considerable resources to be dedicated to the Mediterranean by the Allies. It also threatened his links to oil supply routes in the Middle East and would give Allied aircraft access to German's southern flank if Italy allowed Allied warplanes to be stationed on its territory. Thankfully, the mighty Alps made an overland invasion of Germany from Italy all but impossible, but still Mussolini had to be restored to power, and there was only one man who could get the job done. Locating Mussolini was not easy, as the Italians feared that the Germans would doubtlessly launch a rescue. Hesitant to simply hand him over to the Allies as no armistice had been declared yet, the Italian government had hoped to use Mussolini as a bargaining chip as it sued for peace. To keep the German rescue effort at bay, the Italians moved Mussolini from location to location, making him difficult to track. For weeks, Scorzani and some of his most trusted men worked the streets of major Italian cities, gathering intelligence and intercepting radio messages. Scorzani made free use of counterfeit British pounds, created in yet another unconventional Nazi war plan to defeat the Allies, to bribe Italian officials, and recruit double agents and informants. At last, Mussolini was located, and a rescue plan could be put into effect. But rescuing Mussolini would be one of the riskiest operations of World War II. Fully aware of a plot to rescue their fascist dictator, the Italians had taken great precautions with the imprisonment of Mussolini. They moved the dictator to a mountaintop ski resort high in the Apennine Mountains, which could only be accessed by a cable car. The cable car station was itself guarded by Italian infantry, and at the mountaintop resort Mussolini was guarded by 200 elite Carabinieri guards. The resort was in effect a fortress, with only the cable cars leading up to the top of the mountain. Any troops attempting to use the cars would be slaughtered long before they got a chance to disembark. Rescue would be impossible. But the Italians never counted on the borderline insane daring of Otto Scorzani. Realizing that the only possible way to get to Mussolini would be to avoid the rail cars altogether, Scorzani consulted with some of the best Luftwaffe pilots, and he had one question for them. Could a glider be landed on the grounds of the ski resort, despite the treacherous mountain air currents? Most agreed that technically, yes, it should be possible, but the risk was insane. Unpowered gliders would be completely at the mercy of tumultuous mountain wind currents, and landing room on top of the mountain was already extremely limited. Even if gliders made it safely, it would be a miracle if they stopped in time before tumbling off the edge of the mountain. On the 12th of September 1943, the weather was at last suitable for the attempted rescue, and Otto Scorzani and his men loaded up onto 10 gliders. Each glider carried a single pilot and 9 soldiers, bringing a total of 90 elite SS troopers to face off against 200 heavily armed Italian Carabinieri. But Scorzani had a trump card to play in this gambit. Flying alongside him was General Fernando Soletti, head of the Polizia dell'Africa Italiana, and a respected officer. Scorzani gambled that if caught unawares in a surprise attack and with the presence of a respected Italian officer, the Carabinieri would stand down. He'd soon find out. As the gliders lifted into the air, two companies of German paratroopers launched an attack on the forces holding the cable car station at the base of the mountain. The fighting was fierce, but the Italians were quickly overwhelmed by the far more experienced and capable German troops. Still, not a single German would live to reach the top of the mountain unless Scorzani was successful, and so the troops held their position to prevent Mussolini being moved via the cable cars. The mountain currents made flying treacherous, more so for the unpowered gliders. The bombers towing the first three gliders decided that they needed needed to gain more altitude before releasing the gliders, and thus began long, slow, looping turns to gain altitude. This would threaten the delicate timeline that the operation needed for success, however, and Scorzani ordered the rest of the planes to continue, regardless of the risk to the gliders. If Scorzani could not take and evacuate Mussolini quickly, then more Italian forces would soon be on their way. Released from their two hooks, the gliders shuddered in the tumultuous winds of the Italian mountains. The pilots, among some of the best in Nazi Germany, fought the controls to keep the gliders stable and on course. Incredibly, one by one, the German gliders made the almost impossible landing on the tiny tabletop shelf of land at the top of the mountain. Although one of the last to arrive crashed, severely injuring many of its occupants. Leaping from the gliders though, the bulk of Scorzani's force was soon running toward the hotel, 
Scorzini had given his men a strict order. Not a single one of them was to open fire unless Scorzini opened fire first. If Scorzini was injured or died, then one of his officers would be the first to open fire. It was critical that the assault force capture Mussolini without having to fight the 200 strong Italian defenders. With General Fernando Soletti ordering the guards to stand down, the Italians laid down their arms and allowed Mussolini to be taken. In less than an hour, one of the riskiest operations of World War II had succeeded without a single shot being fired. Scorzini would be an overnight hero to Nazi Germany and earn his place in the Special Forces Hall of Fame if he survived the final phase of the plan to rescue Mussolini, the escape. German forces would be unable to provide security for Mussolini if they tried to bring him down the mountain and move him by land. Therefore, a small plane was ordered to make the incredible risky landing atop the mountain. This would be Mussolini's ticket off the mountain. But there was a problem. The small plane only had enough power and room for its pilot and one other passenger, and Scorzini refused to leave Mussolini out of his sight. The pilot argued with Scorzini, telling him that there was little chance that the plane could hit the required speed for liftoff if it were carrying the weight of the three men. Scorzini refused to budge. Mussolini was his personal responsibility and he would be the one to see him brought before the Führer himself. Then Scorzini pointed out the obvious. If the airplane required velocity to generate lift and the takeoff area was too short, then it would simply have to gain speed by falling off the side of the mountain. Scorzini climbed aboard the tiny plane alongside Mussolini and under the threat of being shot ordered the pilot to take off. The tiny plane sputtered to life and began to roll toward the edge of the mountain, slowly picking up speed. As the precipice loomed before them, the pilot's worst fears were realized. The plane could not take off overburdened as it was. The wheels soon left the ground as the plane pitched over the mountainside. By some miracle, however, the plane shuddered its way back to horizontal after a brief dive. Against all odds, Scorzini had pulled off one of the most daring rescue operations in history. Otto Scorzini would go on to achieve great success during the waning days of World War II, cementing his place as one of Nazi Germany's most dangerous soldiers. The man became an international special forces legend and most of his training and operational methods would go on to influence or be outright adopted by special forces programs around the world. Perhaps most surprising of all, however, would be Scorzini's eventual role as a Mossad agent working for the Israeli secret organization and helping bring Nazi war criminals to justice. Now check out What If Hitler Had Won or click this other video instead.